Poker's legendary champions, next generation stars, and tireless ambassadors of the game, sharing their wisdom and guiding your journey to high achievement on the green felt. This is Chasing Poker Greatness with your host, Brad Wilson. Well, 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 fancy meeting you here on the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. As always, this is your host, the founder of ChasingPokerGreatness.com, Brad Wilson. And today's guest on Chasing Poker Greatness is the winner of the 2016 300K buy-in Super High Roller Bowl, who has racked up over $21 million in live poker tournament caches, Rainer Kimpa. If that sounds like a lot of money and success, that's because it is. Here are just a few highlights of 31-year-old Rainer's poker career thus far. A $2 million score for a third-place finish in 2018 Super High Roller Bowl in Macau. A 900 k victory in the 2019 50 k event at the PokerStars Caribbean Adventure. A ridiculous 41 caches of 100 k plus. That's right. 41. Simply put, Rainer is one of the very best in the world at his craft, and in just a few moments, you're going to learn all about Rainer's origin story as a member of the German crew that includes past CPG guest Fedor Holtz, whose poker triumphs are already the stuff of legend. In today's episode with Rainer Kempa, you're going to learn how Rainer hooked up with Fedor Holtz in Vienna how he felt in his first 10k buy-in event, hint it was not confident, a greatness bomb on how you ought to measure your success, and much, much more. So without any further ado, I bring to you the witty and clever superstar of poker, Rainer Kimpa. Rainer, good evening, sir. How are you doing, my friend? Uh, yeah, I'm good. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me, man. Nice to yeah. meet you, too. Yeah, it's very nice to meet you, too. I've I've been excited to have you on the show, and typically starting out this show, the first place we start is in your journey in discovering cards and navigating your way through poker. So we'll start there. When did you discover cards? Cards. I mean, we played, like, Scott in, in primary school and in and, and college. And then I, um, at the beginning of university or at, at, at the end of high school, uh, I got introduced to poker and played like occasionally, like just with friends for like one euro games and like five and sit and goals or whatever it was back then. Um, and then during university, I uh, started uh, playing a little more and I got involved uh, a little more. Could you tell me about your path through life before? What were you on track to become like through school what was what were your goals and then i assume at some point poker kind of hijacked everything yes that is what happens um but there wasn't like my my goals went um were already pushed aside a little bit so it was easier for for poker to hijack it because i wasn't on on a good path to become a professional uh soccer player because i just wasn't good enough so that's where like a lot of my effort went and then i was at a university uh, studying business administration, which didn't really uh, catch me too much either. So poker had had had, had an easy going to to take over. Yeah, had a clear path, yeah, and nothing, nothing, nothing is tough to be pushed aside. What was it about poker that kind of grabbed you? I, I assume in a way that like soccer kind of did, right? Poker kind of replaced soccer for that like competitive outlet and strategic thinking. Um, why why poker? I mean, I I genuinely like enjoyed it, and like from a gaming aspect, uh, like the first thousand hours I I put in, uh, I don't think money was like uh, that much of an object really. Like it it changed eventually, and maybe the line isn't a thousand hours, but more like you know five hundred. But I uh, I think I genuinely uh, enjoyed and enjoyed the game and wanted to become better and learn it and these kind of things. So I was just. Yeah, I just, I just, I was just like playing more than more than working for the most part, and then eventually, um, 
I I played myself to the to the spot where I was oh, okay wait a moment uh, this might actually be a great opportunity to um to, you know make make a living or like at least put yourself to university and then let's see what else happens. What what led to that thought that oh wait a minute I'm doing this thing I'm spending a lot of time doing it and maybe I could just keep doing this. I mean, this this is probably very financially uh, motivated. Just like suddenly you realize you all you've been doing is you play like six dollar certain goals, you play eleven dollar certain goals, and week after week you have a little more money in the account, and like you know how much money you need to live, and then you know that's kind of what you've made uh, consistently recently. Uh, so that's that's where where this became like an an, op- an opportunity. Like it, I didn't. I wasn't searching for a job or for an income and play poker. That that just kind of, you know, came along the way kind of thing. Leave it to you Germans in efficiency. Just it's a math problem. Oh, this math makes sense to me. Let's do this. No uh <laughs> light light bulb moment like, ah oh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this thing. Um Yeah, it's also with just the just the community. Like it was a, a, a poker school with like mainly with like a German German base. So it was also just like hanging out, hang, like talking content was just like hanging out with friends for like hours and hours uh, straight kind of thing. So it was just like, I, I very randomly, randomly uh, slided into that. Yeah, I don't know that it's random. You know, I think like we just have this way of connecting with our people or finding people with similar interests. And I think that like, at least in the case of um, you guys, there were a lot of you guys that were very, obviously aspiring to play poker at a very high level. And so connecting with those types of people specifically, I think that that is probably what's kind of rare and and random. So once you made the decision to pay your way through school by playing poker, what steps did you take? I feel like when I, when I uh, decided to, to put my way through university with it, I already, uh, I was, I kind of already had achieved that kind of thing. Like, um, and then like once I, once I accepted that for myself, once I decided to, um, to, you know, focus more on poker and do the university thing on the side, the university just straight up went to dust because it was like, you know, it's just like every hour I had to put in, the, had, had, had to put into like studying or writing my bachelor thesis or whatever was so much work in comparison when you just like, you uh, uh, so yeah, I didn't. It, I didn't end up. I didn't make it. Uh, yeah, that goal, that goal was not achieved. I believe um, you. There's an opportunity I, cost, right? <laughs> like a poker opportunity cost um, to investing all the cognitive energy in finishing school, where you could be investing it playing cards, learning, growing, moving up stakes, making more money. Again, very kind of a predictable thing, especially like once you're having success. It's like, oh, young kid starts making some money, moving up stakes. Like school is much less appealing right now. Yeah, yeah. No, I did. I did it all like halfway. Like I played a lot of poker, but I also like made cutbacks in in live poker. Like when when the other guys, for example, they were just like, um, there's this this story that Peter, for example, loves to telling it how we all like had this this house in Canada to grind scoop, and I basically was always the person to compromise uh, instead of staying for three weeks in that house. I only stayed for ten days. Then went back to uh, university and did absolutely nothing there. <laughs> and then, yeah. So that that went that went on for a while. Um, but yeah, why were you you were still you were just trying to make it work? I think I was just I had like um, I ju- I just felt bad about it. Like I was I was eighty five eighty percent of the way through my uh, through my bachelor degree. So it always at every point um, it only would have needed like. 200 more hours to get your degree which is obviously like you know for for a uh, for like an education that takes like at least three three years um that's that seems like an okay number that seems like an achievable number but yeah those those 100 hours um went went doable they were they got harder and harder when the, the, the yeah yeah the um, lesser they were left <laughs> did you ever finish did you ever get your bachelor's no. degree there's no happy end to that story. <laughs> oh, there's a happy ending, I think. I think the happy ending is, you know, you're obviously a very talented poker player and you've managed to carve out quite a successful career for yourself. 
Right. But like, I actually think the university thing, this was always a bit of a, how do you say it? Like a, a chip on your shoulder. Is that, a, is that an expression? It like is. I, I always felt like, uh, like a little bad about it. And I also felt like, um, it uh, drove some other fears that I, uh, like had with poker, like, you know, whenever things weren't going, going so well, like leaving that behind and not finishing it, um, you know, it just gives an easier jump for like, whatever existential crisis uh, you might be feeling coming up, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, so I think, I think, um, I think I could have made life a little easier by, by just being, being better and more effective there, but it just, you know, wasn't, wasn't where the heart was at at all. Yeah. It wasn't in the cards as they say. And I could see that being a concern where like you have this belief that while well, I was so close, I'm so close to getting my degree and it. Like if I, if I quit now and play poker, what's stopping me from quitting when the shit hits the fan in the poker world? I think that the one, the one thing that you have working for you as related to poker is like, there is no alternative at that point. <laughs> like what are, what are you going to do instead of poker? Um, just kind of quitting and doing something else. So at, at least that is something that could prevent a future, future just existential crisis and total career change. Well, that seems a little dark. Why? Wait, wait, wait. Maybe I misunderstood it, but the positive spin uh, was that, that I didn't have any other opportunities? Correct, yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh. That, you're, that you're basically in this, and wh- what are you going to do, you know? I guess, I guess if you quit playing poker, the option is to go back to school, get your degree, and continue that path. I mean, in theory, I feel like the option we're still or are still to like, you know, quit and do whatever I want to do. Right. Like, like I'm, this is in a world where you lose everything and you're broke and you're not successful whatsoever. And you just quit poker. Yeah. But in that world, poker doesn't sound like a great opportunity either. (laughs) It's just like, I don't know. I don't, I don't feel like I, I, I appreciate you. uh, You're trying to make this sound positive, but I don't, I don't love the, I don't love that take. Yeah. I I think, I'm not saying that it's positive. I'm just saying, like, it doesn't matter what I'm saying. It helps. It, yeah, no, I get what you're saying. You have, it helps with commitment, and that uh, commitment doesn't seem to be the worst thing for, for being successful in whatever it is you're doing. For sure. And you obviously had a passion to pursue poker, and you didn't have that same passion to pursue your degree. And I think that also plays a major factor into you know, following your heart, following your bliss, and doing that sort of thing. And you're a young man. You, you, can, you got time, you know? There's... You can get that chip off your shoulder in just a few hundred hours, I guess, mm. s- s- at some point. So when did you make the decision to no more of this 10-day type thing? We're, we're going all the way. Uh, probably like 2.15. Yeah, 2.15 sounds right. When I just like started, started playing life and uh, started not feeling, feeling bad for like not being at university or not being... Uh, being in Europe anymore. Um, so that, yeah, that was still, I mean, I really appreciated the, the, the lifestyle as well, right? Like to, to be able to, to travel to all those stops, like to be able to travel to all those stops for the first time, for the most part, like that was. What that did was Fedor awesome. tell you? What, what did Fedor tell you while you're like oh, staying 10 days, flying back? Like what was the feedback from your peers? Oh, it's, it's pretty generally it's usually you, you do you like you do you and it's also like the reasons that i had were usually solid right like the reason being yeah i'm super close uh i need to finish this and then i'm going to focus on what's next like, yeah you know there's not there's not this, this is like a reasonable thought process absolutely um, like it's and also also back then like if you if you think of fedora it was probably like 19, 20 or something. <laughs> he also didn't have the, the skill set to like help me with the, the biases I was carrying that back then, right? It's like something he, uh, he learned in future. And yeah, in future years, um, I don't think we, we would have been able to, uh, to make our lives, lives easier. I mean, not like our lives were hard by all means, like we had, we had a great time. Uh, but like, yeah, like with the, with the, with the um, knowledge we have now, certain decision could have could have been better and I could have been maybe a little easier with myself or a little more honest with myself and just like yeah just 
yeah, could have could have wasted less energy on the whole on the on the whole thing, or or you know, or waste a little more on it to just finish it. Yeah, uh, I, but but yeah, I forget how young you guys are. You're like you know, six years ago, Fedor is like nineteen. It's like man, yeah. I guess y'all are y'all are just figuring it out on your own too. Like you know, you don't have the life experience or the wisdom to kind of you know navigate your way through like you would today. You know, just six years later. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, and we all already were like kind of lucky that you know it had been done, kind of thing. Like if I if I imagine if I imagine like the whole thing another five years earlier was like basically you know people there were so much so many things people didn't so many things people didn't know and like so many other ways to to like fuck it up in one way or another um, that we already had been warned of by, by by people or just like you know seen how other people made certain mistakes, whether it's, whether it's staking or whether it's, yeah, whatever. Yeah, you had you had a clear path. You, the pioneers had already done their things and learned their lessons and passed it on exactly. to y'all, y'all as you're coming up. Once you did make the jump and you made the decision, like how did your career kind of go after you just went all in? I hate I hate that I keep using these like poker uh, <laughs> poker quips after you fully committed, but it is a poker podcast, so maybe that's the way you say it. I don't that's know. fair. I mean, like things went things went really really went super smooth, right? And to be fair, it's also one of those things when if it hadn't gone that smooth in the beginning, like you know, you, who knows? I might have I might have I would have stayed with poker, but maybe I would have uh, played less and um and played less live poker. But like, yeah, I had like I had like a, a couple of really good runs that year, and then there was always the next thing, the next opportunity, opportunity kind of providing itself. Like I, I do believe at that time we were actually, um, we were, I think we were actually really good. Like um, it still doesn't even make that much sense why we would have been that good, but we kind of just were, or others others weren't that good. Um, so yeah, I think this was like the time. Like 2015, 16, 17 was probably the time where we had the where I felt like I had the biggest edge on on the live tournament fields. Why why um, doesn't that make sense that you guys would be that good? Like first of all, this was all we you know, everybody everybody around me was was that good. So um so the idea that uh, other people were uh, significantly worse kind of Kind of uh, doesn't make sense, and then also I don't think we we did a an absurd amount of anything special. Like yeah, we uh, we spent uh, all our time on poker and thinking poker, but it didn't feel like I it to, I don't think to me it ever felt like super unique what we were doing at the time, right? Like I feel like there should have been. It felt like there could have been more people who who um, you had the same passion and just were like a little more efficient here and there, or just had been doing it for a little bit longer, or were like, you know, just a little bit more talented or you know, anything really. Um and obviously I'm sure there were there were a lot of people who were really good or maybe like better. Um, but I like we just like Fedor obviously went to the top like uh, super quick and uh, all of us had like an absurd amount or like a, a good amount of success uh, super quickly, right? Yeah. And I mean, I could see like coming from, you know, your college career path where people invest many years of dedicated study to just enter a specific field. And then y'all are like 19, 20, 21 years old and have been playing poker for a short time comparatively to, you know, the rest of the people that have been playing poker for as long as y'all have been alive. Right. Do you think that's sort of the disconnect was like, there are so many people that have so much more experience that have been doing this so much longer than us that you just kind of made the assumption that like, they should be at least where we're at. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't, this is obviously like, this sounds, sounds arrogant to like, to like some extent, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, that's kind of what it is, right? Like there's so many people who've had like, uh, at that time, had like a lot of success recently, and then uh, you get there and you play with those people, and you realize, okay, yeah, you know, they they're not actually necessarily that that great, or they are also making uh, making mistakes, and you know, which which also makes sense when like the game changes as much as uh, 
as it does. And like, if you like, you know, if you look like super successful for several years, um, there's also not necessarily a reason to stay like, you know, that that hungry to to stay like the best poker player. Like that completely makes sense to me. Uh, but back then, back then, I was a little a uh, little surprised by it occasionally. I think there's a little bit of like the, I believe it's called the innovator's dilemma, where basically like if you've had success over a long period of time doing things the way that you do them, it's much harder to change the way that you do them to a different way. And so y'all just attacking poker fresh with new perspectives, fresh mindsets from a way that made sense to you, whereas y'all weren't taking very much risk you're just improving your games and trying to play really well. Other people who had had some success may have been more hesitant to change up what they're doing just simply by virtue of their past successes. Right. Right. And the other thing is like, if you've been, if you're like, if you've been super successful, if, you, if you've made a lot of money with poker, like the, the money that is to make in poker also isn't that shouldn't be that, relevant to you anymore so it's it probably a good decision at some point to you know not put all your energy into into staying on top right like uh why would you like yeah that make, that makes a lot of sense you probably wouldn't because you're living your life and doing other things exactly cool so yeah so y'all are having your success you're leveling up you're improving your games I know that when Fedor came on the show, he talked about going through basically a, he, he had a one very difficult year. Um, could you tell me in, in your journey, like when you think about pain in your poker career, what's the first memory that comes to mind? So, yeah. So the first like memories that I came up with were like, um, just like, like a face where it felt like I didn't, it didn't play well, where it just wasn't, wasn't like aware of what was happening where I didn't feel like very fresh and I just like you know grinded it down and felt like I had to be there and I didn't actually love it that much which you know was a little little frustrating and then another thing is obviously just like a downswing that one had um but those were not like connected like the biggest downswing and the time I felt like I played the worst when when like the same and like the same time and then yeah generally generally the dark phases Oftentimes, I just like losing a lot of money, feeling like maybe this is, um, this is, maybe I'm just like, not only wasting my time, maybe I'm actually not beating the games anymore. Like these kind of thoughts uh, will hit you occasionally. And then, then we're back to um, to not finishing our degree. And we feel like, uh, yeah, maybe if I'm fucking this one up, uh, then I'm, then I'm, I'm, I end up with, with nothing, like some sort and kind of uh, existential, existential uh, dilemma and just going going to to bed with like a weird feeling in your in your belly or whatever but i don't know like i don't think anything anything of that was like like strange or 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 um out of line like it's you know it's uh, it's just like it's not like i was i was um suffering an absurd amount it's just like you know you doubt yourself a little bit here and a little bit there and I feel like that's that's fair and part of the part of the process yeah i've had well over a hundred people on all of my friends who are professional poker players, everybody that I know has experienced all of those crises at some point or another, where you just go to sleep with that. Like you said, the, that feeling in your stomach of like, Oh my God, like, am I even winning at poker anymore? Will I ever win again? Like yeah. I'm just, am I just ever going to win money at this again? Am I going to end up broke in a ditch, poor with nothing homeless? Um, so out of those 100 people, for how many of those was the answer? Yes, that's exactly what's going to happen to you. Well, like I, 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 <laughs> what do you mean? No, I mean, I, I just I was just joking around. I, yeah, like half. The problem is the people that it happens to don't get to come on my show because they're living in cardboard boxes on the side of the road. Mm. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's sort of the, um, uh, that's the catch, but I think mostly it's something that everybody that's in poker, that is an expert at poker that has been playing forever, that has had levels of success over various year, you know, a number of years all have these same existential crises at some point. And it's just, to me, it's just human biology. It's how we're constructed and it's just part of, yeah, it's part of the journey. Yeah, you would probably have that if we had, even if we had like 
pick the job with a little less variance in it, uh, that would, to some extent, probably still be a thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the follow-up question to my the pain question is joy. When you think about your poker career and you think about joy, what's the first memory that comes to mind? I think like starting starting on the on the live circuit. Like I remember winning a satellite to like WPT Prague. Uh, must have been two fifteen, maybe even end of two thousand fourteen. And I remember selling like winning the satellite and then selling it for it, selling for it in a, in, a, in like a forum or whatever. And I I sold it for one point zero five, and somebody bought it. And I remember like Julian and me just like sitting there and feeling like, oh, right, cool. So if this is a thing, if I can actually like sell my actions to to like these kind of live tournaments, I can like literally go wherever I want to go, right? Like even if it's yeah, I mean, looking looking back, those that kind of uh, probably wouldn't have been enough to to like afford the the traveling lifestyle. But you know that 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 was just something that. Um, came out of nowhere right like i hadn't really thought about playing live or like i hadn't really been playing live and still you know suddenly that was an option and i remember that was kind of a kind of a high high feeling yeah that i mean it's also validation like in your ability and your skills as a poker player and your reputation and like oh i can sell pieces of myself and don't have to take on all the risks and yeah i could certainly see how that could be a, a very joyful moment in your poker career and what would you say, what's the most surprising thing that's happened in your poker career? Something just totally unexpected. Mm, most surprising thing in my poker career. I mean, the transition to, to like high rollers and, and super high rollers was definitely something that I didn't really expect at the time that I felt like I was more like kind of pushed into. Um, what do you mean by that pushed into? I mean, it's just like, you know, in that scenario, like before I played my first uh, 10K was basically Fedor telling me, yeah, this is a great tournament. Uh, you have to play this. And like, I hadn't even, like, I didn't even see the um, the option of, of of playing kind of, right? Like I didn't, I didn't have that in my, in my mind. I was like, first, first 10K I, I played in, must have been, must have been Prague, I guess as well. And I just remember like sitting down with like Andreas Eiler, Martin Finger, Thomas Müllocker, then then an English guy, um, like a, uh, Hicks or Higgins. I always always confuse those two, like the the bigger one out of the two. And like outside of being like they they played like the the most absurd hands from the very beginning, and I was like super intimidated, uh, and also busted it like super quickly. Uh, so, so you were you were nervous. You sat that you had a nervous energy in your first ten k. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, and I also just basically hadn't really played with those guys um, at the time. Just no, known them from from like TV or whatever. So that was that was a humbling, humbling, humbling experience. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> when did you fire up your next ten k? Uh, it took me a while. I. Uh, I I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think oh I think like in Malta or something. But like half a year later. Uh, I definitely I definitely wasn't uh, wasn't too convinced of, of of like the high roller scene uh and and my role in it uh, after that experience. <laughs> and then yeah, obviously that's like how it how it goes, right? Then you try again, you win like two flips more than the, the first time and suddenly you're like, a lot more comfortable. That's the poker. That that's just poker. That's the emotional I mean, roller yeah. coaster. Like for the I'm most a, part, a lot of it is. Yeah. yeah, I'm I'm an idiot. I'm horrible. Um, and now all of a sudden I'm a genius. Like yes. one, one moment you're an idiot, the next moment you're a genius, and it's hard to stay in between either side. Yeah, for sure. Um, eventually though. You got more comfortable, obviously, playing in the 10Ks. Uh, tell me about you know the su success that you had once you kind of came to the conclusion that like, yeah, I can compete. I've got an edge against these guys. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the the market in 2016 uh, was also like super good for it. Uh, I think the high order scene 
was was like they had like a an okay amount of recreational players and they had an um an okay number of of players who used to be very good and were now only good right like they just like lost their lost their hunger to some extent whether it's like the american crew or like the the german crew at the time um a lot of them also kind of didn't keep playing for too much longer right? that was just yeah they didn't want to they didn't want to fight that that hard anymore and we kind of wanted to so, so i thought the i think uh, like looking back um if you compare it to now where like a lot more people um play like 25ks and 50k back then there was like a big um um ent- entry barrier like the good players who could have played the 50k didn't play the 50k for like a bunch of reasons. So it was only the players who already played them. Um, and that just provided, I think, like a good opportunity to to get in because once you were in, um, you didn't really fall out because very clearly you were, or there was, it wasn't hard to see that uh, you were probably good enough to, to beat the games. Yeah, and then if you have a score or two, all of a sudden... You know, you've you're in those games a lot more often. Yeah, also just like people are able to see like that that what I was doing was was good enough kind of thing. Yeah, you can you can sell sell parts of yourself too if you want to sell action. Yeah, yeah, which is in that in that um, area of buy-ins, like obviously mandatory. Yeah, it's (laughs) fifty k. It's hard to have a big enough bankroll to fade fifty k MTTs. I would think. Yeah. Yeah, so what would you say compared to today, your motivation, your drive from when, you know, 2015, 2016, has it gone down any over the course of time? Is it still very, very high? Um, it definitely goes through through different phases, right? Like it's not that as high as it was 2015. Um, that feels safe to say. Um, interestingly, since like the corona lockdown uh it's it's been increasing like i kind of enjoy uh enjoy playing online more than i thought i would um like even on a like i don't have to i don't have to force myself but just like genuinely uh feel like i i want to play an okay amount of the time how often is, would you for, force yourself before how often did you have to force yourself to play i mean i didn't i didn't have to force myself very hard but if i had the decision whether I want to, you know, go play basketball or go play poker outside of potential financial gain or some, some, some weird uh, GPI point type of chase, you know, I, I would have probably picked, uh, picked the, 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 the volleyball thing, like at least half of the time. Yeah. Which is, which is, I don't think that's, that, that's absurd. It doesn't mean I, uh, I hated what I was doing. I was still enjoying it, but no, I'm yeah, sorry. I would. I wouldn't have spent 320 days a year sitting in sitting in some silly silly casinos in in um, I don't I don't know Bay 101. No yeah, offense. It, <laughs> no offense to the Bay. The Bay Area is a good place. That might be surprising to the listener, a little bit surprising to them, but I mean that's just how it goes, right? Like it's not that you're forced; it's just that you're not waking up running to your computer to reg a bunch of tournaments and spend all day playing and if another option presents itself hanging out with friends then typically at least i know in my case i hung out with my friends i mean poker was like okay i guess if i don't have anything else to do and no other priorities then i'm just going to sit down and grind and play poker but yeah i mean I, i again i think that's a very very normal thing but the audience might be surprised about it yeah right and like and like also in the beginning that wouldn't have been the case right like i i wouldn't even like i wouldn't even have been a question you just like you wake up you're excited to to, to play some to fire some sitting goals absolutely that's life right like that's life you do something long enough then it, it kind of the ma- the magic goes out of it just just a little um just a little and then it sometimes comes back then it comes back and again it's like the roller coaster of emotions as a poker player uh from day to day but just in our lives you know you like right now i'm making a ton of content i'm making courses i'm helping people i'm trying to make an impact and i haven't gotten a chance to play poker and like the times that i get down get to sit down and like play some cards 
I enjoy. It, it, it's exciting to me. It's like, wow, I'm not doing this every single day. And it's the only thing that I do with my entire life. Now it's sort of a, yeah, it, it's a, what's the, it's more scarce. It's a more scarce activity, I guess, than it used to be. Yeah, I don't know the word. Yeah, basically, I don't have the option to just play poker for 14 hours a day, every day anymore. So, John, you've used neutralized flop leads in the past 24 hours, correct? Yeah, so I got the basically the slide with all the info on it on Friday evening, and yesterday I played a session of uh, 1KNL on Ignition and played one particular pot that I remember where a fish just donked flop turn river into me and I ended up winning with a hand that I would have folded before looking at the slide but I ended up winning like a $400 pot instead and the course is $99 so (laughs) definitely paid for itself very very quickly and I think that'll be the case for even people that aren't playing as big as 510 no limit like I think this is a course that will very very quickly pay for itself given how how much more donking there is at lower stakes. And I think one of the most common questions I see asked in the Greatness Village Slack group is, what do donks mean? How do I deal with donk bets? I, I think that's got to be like in the top three most frequently asked questions. You you ought to feel very excited when somebody donks into you because some good things are about to happen. You said like you probably don't need anyone to teach the course or like you can just look at the slide and, and learn all the info yourself. I feel like you, Brad, will have to be there because I am I am almost sure, sure that anybody who looks at the slide won't believe it looking at what they're supposed to do and will have to confirm with you that like you didn't make a massive typo somewhere and that this is actually what they're supposed to do because it's pretty shocking the optimal way to deal with fish donking into you on the flop is. If you'd like to check out Neutralize Flop Leads so that you're never again confused when a fish leads into you in a single race pot, head to ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash Nuffle. That's ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash N-U-F-F-L-E. And now, back to the show. So what do I guess I'll ask about today. Uh, Not when you were fully immersed with Fedor in 2015, 2016, just full of fire and energy to study, be the best that you could be 24 hours a day. Uh, what, what does your process look like now for getting better on a regular basis? Um, I mean, nowadays, I'm actually, I, uh, I stumbled into the, into the same group of people again, right? Like I uh, moved back, I moved to, um, to Vienna, where like, you know, where like the, the original group, um, who like lives kind of like Fedor as my Fedor as my neighbor. Fedor started playing poker as well again. Uh, so actually, there's like a, a certain kind of um, of uh, of second rush going on in that group in regards to like yeah, sometimes sometimes uh, quest, questions emerge during during coffee, and then it has to be it, it, we look we look up um, what happens there. So it, we we I I kind of feel like I'm in a in a more um, natural. Uh, natural uh, learning learning stage um, again, where just the people around me are are, are interested and uh, and yeah, good at it. And then there's yeah, so some some coachings and and these kind of things. T- tell me how that goes. You and Fedor are having coffee. What's like a question that comes up that piques your interest so much that like you you want to know the answer? Uh, you have frozen. Um, I, I stopped after it stopped after a question that piqued my interest, which was probably enough to. That was, yeah. that was that was probably where the question could have ended up. That that was. Um, but I mean, it used to be. It used to come from a point of um, of you an idiot. No, you an idiot. <laughs> I'm going to prove to you that you're an idiot. Uh huh. Um, and now it's, it's like now it's a little more chill. Now it's like more like yeah, I don't think so. Which is the which is the okay but i i actually looking back i really i really enjoyed the shots the shouting matches over over like basic basic uh question like you know just like random turn sizings but yeah now that you that you can just look of these look a lot of these things up easier it doesn't give the it doesn't give too much like potential to to put yourself 
too wide out out the out the window. Yeah, I I could certainly see that it, it's much easier to settle these heated debates nowadays yeah. than it which was six years ago. Which kills the heated debates. <laughs> Yeah, you you guys need to just just start playing a brand new game, and then you yeah. have more more heated debates. Oh, probably. I, I'd love that. That'd be awesome. Have you? Uh, I don't, I'm not even sure that I know the answer to this. Do you play any mixed games or any games other than Hold'em? I uh, no. I mean, I play I play PLO like mainly mainly tournaments, but I I'm not like good at it. <laughs> um, and I've tried, I've tried like the mixed game and like, you know, doing like a random 1500 WSOP event. And I'm obviously not good at those either. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like those could be fun, but during the series, when you, when you're any, when you're like playing so much poker anyways, like you don't, I don't, I've never felt like uh, my head was fresh enough to really enjoy uh doing something completely different. Like I had some good experiences with it, but for the most part, I think like if I, if I would play mixed games at like, you know, just to, instead of the, at the WSOP, I would play it in like Aussie millions. I would be able to enjoy the Badoobies of this world um, more than I have in Vegas. But yeah, it's still, it's still fun. It's still like something different and new and like wakes you out of the, out of the uh, routine a little bit, which is, which is great. Again, yeah, and it, not good at it. <laughs> um, well, you've invested very minimal time, so that's that's only to be expected. And I can see too, like, there's always an opportunity cost, right? Like, are you going to reg a 1500 mix tournament, or are you going to play like the 10k six max? It, it's like obviously you're probably going to take the 10k six max, and then if you're going to play a mixed game tournament, it's on a day where you have no other options, and that's a day where you could just not play poker and go play basketball instead. Right. So I could see that it's, it's really hard to fit in those specific tournaments to your schedule. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's not only, yeah, it's not only, uh, like it's, it's also like, it's, you're losing, you're losing player in those, right? Like you're being realistic. You're like, a, you have to be a losing player in these kind of games. So it's not only that you use one of the few, um, Days off that you could potentially have. You're also kind of spending like in, now suddenly you're suddenly spending two hundred fifty dollars to sit in the Rio where you sit. You've been sitting the whole summer, anyways. That's like for the yeah. When you put it like that, I'm surprised by how much how many mixed games tournaments I've actually played. <laughs> it's okay to spend money for fun, Rainer. That's that's yes. the point. You, we spend money to have fun. So if you're having fun playing the mixed games, it, yeah. it shouldn't be that surprising. That's fair. What do you think is the most high impact action players can take to improve their poker game? I mean, for me, it's always been finding people on a similar similar level with similar interests and and whatever you've been doing, now you do it as a group kind of thing. Um, and yeah, you, like th- that part doesn't depend on the level you're on, while everything else um, depends on the level you're on. Right? Like if you're fairly new to the game, or like you've been playing a lot, but fairly new to content that I think like some of the courses that are out there are actually really good, like crazy good actually. Um, and we got to learning quickly, but then it's also, you know, suddenly you're, you're like, you're like learning, right? Like you're, uh, you're studying and like most people who get into poker don't want to want to study, which I think is very fair. You, you, think- you, you have to you need you have to find a way to um like if you like you have to find a way w- whether the improvement makes it is like fun right sure otherwise it's it's it's, it's a lot harder and i feel like the, the, with those courses or with like a lot of the the, the solar grind and these kind of things for a lot of people that's going to be not that easy to enjoy i can say with a, a little bit of shame, people would probably be surprised at how little studying I did from like, you know, I, what they think of studying in just like book work and working out mathematical equations. Like my form of study that I've always loved is just sitting with a friend and talking about stuff. Like you said, having a debate and being like, hmm, let's look at this. This might be better than this. Let's like test this against this and basically bouncing ideas off of each other. That's exciting. That's fun. I could 
do that for five or 10 hours probably every day. If you sit me with a, a workbook in front of my computer, just looking at solves and taking notes or whatever, that is like kind of my own brand of torture. I, I can't, uh, I, I don't love that at all. Yeah, no, I, I, I understand that uh, for the most part. And, and, but, you know, it's just these things used to work a lot better when barely anyone had access to anything else, right? Sure, yeah. Like if that's, yeah, that's... The software's ruined it all for just ruined everything. Um, I think still though, having a community, there's just so much value in having somebody that's immersed in the same thing you are. It, it just, you're absolutely right that like finding your tribe, finding your people that can support you, that can help you, that you can support, that you can challenge each other, you can push each other to getting better. There's really no substitute for it that exists as it relates to just being the best poker player that you can be, in my opinion. So imagine there's a carbon copy of Rainer who's just getting into poker now. So it's you six years ago. You get to have lunch with that kid. Mm -hmm. What wisdom would you share with young Rainer? I mean, usually I would like everyone who, who, uh, who starts out in poker, who I'm sitting down with, I'm usually telling, eh, maybe, <laughs> maybe this is not a great idea. Uh, well, that would that's, that might kill you. I don't know how the multiverse works, but if you told <laughs> yeah, if future if future me uh, comes and tells me to stop what I'm doing, I would probably consider consider that for a moment at least. Yeah, you might accidentally kill yourself. Yeah, I would probably just like tell myself to not, uh, you know, to not. I th I think I thought too much of um, of pure hourly in in poker. Like, I think I've made a couple of decisions that uh, that weren't great overall to, you know, just make, like, that amount of EV in there and there kind of thing. Um, and I don't think that that really helped me. I think there were um, – it was just, like, an an easy way to feel feel productive, you know, like, if I, if I uh, go to, go to Ziminole – um, and and uh, play the 5k and the 10k, uh, and then fly back. I make this amount of EV. EV is good. I do it. Um, but like looking looking back, I didn't. I don't think those were the were always the right decision. I think I could have uh, thought in a bigger picture here and there. What, what do you mean by that? A bigger picture. How would you go about it today? Um, I mean, just just value value things that uh, that you enjoy and uh, value like stops where you feel good and these kind of things like yeah obviously i i uh, love poker and i love playing poker and there would have been there were there are a lot of great spots for me where i can play poker make ev um and enjoy myself yeah um, and you know it helps to not always push push every spot um and also just like probably helps the quality of your game in a good amount as well. Um, and then, but now again, this feels, doesn't feel like I'm giving advice to me, uh, to me when I'm starting out. It feels a little more like I'm giving advice to me right now. Uh, <laughs> I, I think, I think what you're getting at is like, there's value in the experience, right? That you're not quantifying that's left out of the EV calculation is like, maybe you make less going somewhere, but you have a much better experience. And the value of that is more than the, the EV, right? Yes. And it'll probably also show in the EV, which is just a fun little twist in the end. <laughs> well, ultimately, it, I, I, yeah. Anyway, we'll move on. What What's some common poker advice you hear that you completely disagree with oh that's a great question i i like the question i have because like i it feels like it comes comes up so often uh where, where like somebody says something and you're just like yeah um, but unfortunately i there's nothing that like jumps jumps to my mind can you give me some examples can you give me some some examples and I just say stop? Yeah, some examples of 
Oh man, now you, you you turn the tables on me. You put the spotlight on me, and I, I'm un, unprepared. I, I should have some you good got, answers. You here. got this. You got this. I'm gonna have to think. My we we have an a- editing crew. The producer will edit this shit out. Let's let's make them work for their money. Okay, so like for me, common poker advice. I hear that I completely disagree with. Don't bluff fish, and fish don't fold. I think those are two that I very very much disagree with. That people <laughs> commonly say. I mean, it depends on how far I go back. Like there were some people that would say never slow play aces. Uh, back back in the day, like always raise or fold, never call. That's another just really, really bad one. Yeah, okay. You're crushing this. <laughs> I, I feel like I feel like you're just you're somehow making me do all the work right now. <laughs> so we need to, that eureka, the light bulb moment to switch on for Rainer. That's, yeah, I have to admit, like once you started uh, thinking about it, I kind of uh, took a, took a break as well and stopped thinking at <laughs> all. I knew it. I knew it. There has to be like some on, on the like because you your your examples for the most part were like content things. But there must be some on like a, on like a emotional, you know, on an, on an emotional, intellectual kind of level that I feel like are overrated. Um, I think people not feeling their emotions, um, like don't feel emotions, be a robot. I think I, I very much disagree with that because I think it's impossible as human beings. I, I, that hasn't been, I haven't been told that. Yeah, I mean... Some people say it, like, just be the Terminator and play and, you know, switch your emotions off. Make Just always make good decisions and it, emotions are weak. What about in regards to, like, only play when you're, when you're feeling, feeling good? I think like- that, yeah, that's, that's a little bit more nuanced um, because our brain can constantly... I, I do like that, though, because our brain constantly lies to us and tells us like ah, oh, you don't really want to do that maybe you should just take the day off um you really have to make yourself sit down in the chair and play sometimes that's, yeah that's kind of my take on it as well and then there has to have, i'm you know i'm gonna i'm gonna invest another uh, 120 seconds into this one because there has to be like some some kind of you know like a you know you know like a like an instagram uh, page or something where somebody posts a lot of uh, of generic uh, poker advice uh i don't know let me see okay let's see i have like a i have a 18 i have a list of 18 here <laughs> okay classify each player by player type uh i, I actually like that i think that uh, that one is very underrated these days like the was it one of i think i actually have you or something said that once or i heard him say that where he just like categorize every player in like like an i think an animal category or something so this one's a penguin this one is a, is a wolf or whatever I, uh, mm-hmm. and, it, and i think he said he has like 20 of those animals and just like puts them towards one of them <laughs> and like there's, there could be a lot of things i'm confusing about that story but i think that's actually great advice and i don't do that but i think that's great so that's not that's common advice that you agree with that you completely agree with yeah just doesn't help us in regards to the, to the search <laughs> rate. Yeah. No. So have no fear. Label people as chipmunks. That's good. Yes. This is all like really, really good, good stuff. Yeah, it is actually. Like, can, I, can, <laughs> can I? Can I just send this list? Like, if I sit sit down with myself, I want to give them this list. <laughs> Pay attention to stack sizes. Very solid. Let them knock each other out. Yep. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So after a quick after a quick Google search, all the all the content out there is rock solid. There you go. There and then I have to then I have to take back my remark uh in the beginning where I said this is a great question. It's a it's a silly question and you should have been better. <laughs> all poker advice is good. Take it from Rainer Kempe. There's not none that he disagrees with whatsoever. If you could gift every poker player one book to read what would it be and why and it does not have to be about poker about specifically poker? Mm-hmm. these days all, all the books i'm reading is the books that sam grafton recommends to me and then i i'm like halfway through and then i stop um so no i can't 
can't think of a book that where I feel like uh, it changed it changed my life. And the ones that I can can think of, I feel like uh, they like helped me. I like just yeah, they seem like they're very um they very well known and have been recommended a bunch bunch of times. And like you know, just I don't know, like four agreements or or these kind of things where you just like easy easy reads where when you when you like just like stop a second and because like something hits you it's like you know it's like can be super valuable yeah um be impeccable with your word i love the the four agreements i don't think that anybody's ever said the four agreements actually so it even if they have i i think that this is a good opportunity to remind folks to check out the four agreements because i i do love that book and like you said very simple very straightforward and easy read and also packs a punch what about content any like documentary any form of content that's not just books oh uh, i mean i have to like i feel like there's so many great podcasts podcasts about like every topic out there um but like also like there's none that i like i don't listen i don't i don't listen to a lot of them um but yeah i feel like whenever i do whenever there's a topic that i'm interested in and i do i'm always surprised by um uh, by how how easy people make it for you these days to get get good content so just podcast across the board that's <laughs> that's the answer here okay <laughs> You're really bringing the heat in these lightning <laughs> round questions, Rainer. <laughs> I could have, could have warned you about this before. <laughs> okay. If you could wave a magic wand, you ha you have to have an opinion on this one, I think. If you could wave a magic wand, change one thing about poker, what would it be? I think shot clocks are overrated. I think... A ten plus tournaments are overrated. Actually, they're not overrated, but they're uh, being being played too much. I think we're gonna we're gonna uh, leave the, the 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 chips the chips shuffling out of out of it uh, in the in the future. I feel like uh, Corona has been has been doing something in in that regards. So I feel like that's that's gonna change. So if you get rid of shot clocks, what do you replace it with, or nothing? Just like maybe just decency to some extent. Oh, good like, luck. I feel like, <laughs> well, I, I still have the one here. You're, you're you're forgetting, you, forgetting, oh, yeah. Forgetting. I can't make fun of you because you have the magic wand. Exactly. Make, pe make everyone decent is what you would do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, for the, for, the, for the most part, I don't think the problems with it were as big as people made it out to be. I think just, there was just like a lot of uh, of of hate towards certain certain people that just like yeah where where shot clocks I I also had like saw a lot of situations now where where shot clocks didn't speed up the game but they still um, made people like the, the people that were the most uncomfortable with it were the ones that we don't want to be uncomfortable kind of thing. Right, like I mean, the idea of playing like a, a WPT main event, and once you get to the bubble, you introduce the shot clock, and then you keep it for the rest of the game, is seems like so absurd to me on so many levels. It's like because like the pros have all played with shot clock and they don't really care or mind that much. It also slows down the game because now everybody knows they're allowed to take thirty seconds, and the people like you know who are like deep in their first main event ever are suddenly, uh, you know, on a clock that they haven't used before and they use time bank chips that they haven't used before um, and these, these kind of kind of thing. Um, but yeah, anyways, like the, I, I wouldn't want to, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't want to use the, the magic one to forbid shot clocks. I feel like I, 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 uh, I went down, I went down a path here that I didn't want to, I didn't. I didn't feel that strongly about. But you know, you put, you put me in the corner with the uh, I suck at lightning round. So I just went with the first thing that I came to my head, and now here we are. Uh, you had the real life shot clock. This is what happens. Uh, oh, exactly. People make bad decisions with shot clocks. That's why I don't like shot clocks. <laughs> yeah, there we go. I, I I don't know. 
how much to go down this path, but I, I, I will say like, I don't play a lot of tournaments. I don't, I, I hate the stalling like cash games. You're incentivized to play fast. And um, I think like the only solution that's ever made any sense to me is to remove the incentive to stall in some way. Like if you could do that, then you're, that would be the place to start because obviously near a bubble situation, like there is incentive to salt, right? Like that's why people do it. If there was no incentive, then nobody would stall. Nobody would take so much time. So whether it's like some sort of penalty, I don't know what it is, but some sort of, some sort, some sort of penalty for playing slow, whether you lose big blinds, something like that. I don't know. Yeah, but that, that feels like, you know, like it's obviously tough, if you do do these kind of things more subjectively, right? Like if somebody's wasting time, they're going to be put on a shot clock. Uh, but like if somebody takes four minutes in a big river decision, then I feel like that's part of the game, right? Like I like I like it because it's it's not it's not that easy to to run a big bluff in a big spot and sit there for five minutes. Like it's stressful, um, and it's I think it's a big part of the game. Um, and, and there's there, there's never a time I think in, in my whole cash game career where there's a massive pot and like you just give that person that's at, at that decision point as long as they need to make the decision. Yeah, exactly. um, that's different than like sitting under the gun for a minute and folding like when you have do seven off right like that's a, those are two totally different things and the okay. last but the but that also doesn't really happen. Like, yeah, it happens to some extent in like a very specific uh, part of the tournament. But the most the biggest the biggest problem is people and like I have to include myself in that one. It's like on the flop, like against the random seabed, you like you know you think twice two minutes and you structure your range to some extent. And that's where like a lot of time, like that's where the where the game gets super slow. Like nobody's actually wasting time. People are just taking the time uh, they need or that yeah and they you know in that spot you kind of take it on um on everybody else's um downside kind of thing like there's not and like if you're allowed to that's not necessarily wrong but that's i think that's where like most of the time like the, the seven deuce offsuit uh under the gun tank is a extremely uncomfortable and b it's not very common yeah like i don't think that's where most of the time went goes well there you go you use your magic wand, you just get rid of the flop. It's salt. <laughs> or, or the seven deuce. No more no, seven deuce. Just no more flop. Just we just the hand ends pre-flop and we all go home. Oof. <laughs> Oof. That'd be all that would also be great. So, sounds like sounds like action, like an action game. Actually it doesn't at all, huh? It sounds like No. That sounds pretty horrible. That, that kills it. Somebody please take the magic wand away from us. We're <laughs> we're doing awful things with it. If you could erect a billboard, every poker player's got to drive past on the way to the casino. What's your billboard say? Quick little reminder to make good choices. That seems like that seems useless and not wrong at all. <laughs> like it actually doesn't. It seems it seems like an okay advice. It seems okay, but if we drill down into it, we're gonna find some problems pretty quickly. I think, but. That's fine. We'll, we'll, <laughs> I, I I asked the judges; they accept it. Nice. Let's go. Um, what would what's something people would be surprised to learn that you're horrible at, besides rapid fire questions? No, oh, people know. People people get that. <laughs> um, I'm not good at remembering hands. Like at the end of a long day of a tournament, it will be incredibly hard for me to remember five hands of, of the day. Like I'm like, if I'm, if I'm, um, if I'm like in there and I've, if, if, I've had, if I have my head in it, then I have like three decisions that will haunt me, haunt me for like an okay amount of time. But like every hand that I didn't struggle with on some level, whether I played it myself or somebody else played it, or like something is when there's no, you know, when there's no disconnect uh, in to, in some to some level in the hand, then I, it's just straight gone. Has that always been the case, or is that something that's yeah. happened more over time? No, I think that's always been the case. But like in the beginning, there were like more situations where like there was a disconnect, so it happened more often. Yeah, now that you say that, that makes a lot of sense because the same thing happened to me 
in the beginning, I remembered most of the hands, but that was probably because I sucked at most of the hands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Over, over time, like you, you play a few thousand hands in a day and like, I yeah, couldn't, I couldn't tell you tomorrow, any of the hands that I played pretty much. Yeah. You might have a good answer for this one. What's a poker related thing you've tried that other people rave about that didn't work for you? Poker related doesn't have to be like short deck. It can also be like meditation or, uh, or rock climbing or hot yoga. Is hot yoga poker related? Does that still count? But Are there a lot of people raving about hot yoga and the <laughs> poker effects of rock climbing? I don't know. I feel, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I've been told a lot of rock climbing stories in, uh, in Vegas every summer. Like a lot of people waking up at five o'clock. Uh, to go rock climbing that's not going to be my pick but i think rock climbing is is, is great for poker um the 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 meditation part probably more so um i feel like that's that's like like you fairly agreed on that that helps a lot of people uh, and a lot of people feel feel better through it with it not like i've i've gone that route gone gone down that route a lot but um that never like necessarily spoke to me. Any reason why? I think I like my mindset for the game for the most part. Um, I don't, yeah. And I, and like, I, I don't, I, um, I also feel like when sitting down, I have like enough time to, to like channel myself or to, to, you know, push myself towards the, towards the, the, the emotion that I feel like is appropriate in the point or whatever. Like I don't, yeah, I don't, I like, it's, it's like a bit of a, I mean, safe place is a big word, but like, it's like, it's pretty slow <laughs> sitting on a live poker tournament is pretty slow. Uh, I, I never felt like I, I have to um, slow myself down before I start. That makes a lot of sense. You get a lot of practice meditating, just sitting there anyway. Yeah. Be careful about, people telling you to go rock climb early in the morning, by the way, you never know. They might just be trying to get all the Germans to go rock climb just in case, you know, maybe they, <laughs> maybe the tournament fields get a little bit easier. We get these guys scaling massive cliffs. Um, it's always, the, it's always the good ones that ask you uh, to go rock climbing. <laughs> like, I don't think, I don't think uh, people with bad intentions go rock climbing at five o'clock in the morning. No, they probably don't. And that, you know, that, that, that's interesting that it's only the great players that are going, waking up at 5.00 AM and going rock climbing. I don't know. I don't know the connection there, but there's gotta be something, right? Maybe that they have a lot of free time on their hands. I mean, I mean, it, it does make sense, right? Like, like there's like the good players just follow through the things they do. And like the, the not, a lot of the not successful um, uh, people, they also probably talk and okay, on about, about rock climbing. They just don't follow through with it because it turns out it's tough to go rock climbing at five o'clock. That's man. That, that is a greatness bomb. That is a great point that like a measure of success is making yourself do things when you don't want to do them. And the people that can regularly do that just seem to have so much more success than the people who don't. It doesn't even have to be, you don't even have to push yourself towards things that you don't want to do. It's like, it's especially important in this example, in the rock climbing example, that you are capable of, like you're not pushing yourself to things that you don't want to do. You're just pushing yourself to like a little bit of com uncomfortability to the thing that you want to do, which is like, you know, it's even more uh, disappointing if you're being slowed down on, on that way. Because like, you know, it's hard to do things that you don't want to do, but sometimes it's like, like the, once you're up, you're probably actually going to enjoy the experience kind of thing. Yeah, always. I'm, I feel like I'm talking like someone who has been rock climbing before, but that's <laughs> not, not the case. You don't even know if you enjoy the experience. You're just, it's pure speculation. You I just think wanna, they do. I do want to recommend <laughs> it to everybody. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, man. What's, uh, what's your current big goal in poker? Probably along the lines of um, how to put this. Like, I want to... it. I want it to be an opportunity still, and I don't want to feel like I'm uh, I'm stuck with it at it. Like I, my my goal would be to um, to like you know take the 
or like you know, I I enjoy the game. I got I've gotten so much great stuff out of it, um, and it still gives me like a lot of a lot of great opportunities. And I you know, but like, um, so my goal is basically to not let it handcuff me. You know, just like a the golden cage kind of kind of thing. Um, so yeah, that would be that would be my goal to not make uh, make decisions towards it that I um that will you know make me I don't know, less happy or something in the long run. Yeah, prioritizing the experiences, the journey, the life more than just the cold hard EV, right? Exactly. Um, what's a project you're working on that's near and dear to your heart? Well, I'm looking into. I want to um, own a, a soccer team in uh, in in Vienna, just like not a, not in like the professional leagues for now, but just in, in the smaller leagues, and um, and build build that up with like a I don't know, like just a social media presence and like uh, stream the stream the games and these kind of things. Um, and I yeah, it's it's with with um, with like no sports being allowed outside right now or inside for that matter. Um, that project has moved a lot in the last, um, in the last uh, 10 months or something. Uh, but I do think the, the setup we have here is, uh, is pretty good for it. And uh, yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited about whether that's gonna, if, yeah, if that's gonna, gonna happen, that'd be a cool thing. Yeah. Owning your own soccer team. That's a, that's a kind of a, bucket list type thing i would think pretty cool pretty cool thing um best of luck to you by the way Thank and you. final question where can the chasing poker greatness audience find more about you on the world wide web as in like social media or as in i mean i have a twitter account no big deal <laughs> no, <Six stop. laughs> go ahead um so i mean that's that's where where it's like that would be the easiest way to reach out for me for, for sure like instagram and uh and twitter cool man i appreciate you uh, i really enjoyed our our conversation i loved how excruciatingly painful the lightning round questions were that's i that's what i do <laughs> i very much want to do it again sometime in the near future best of luck owning your soccer team thank you once again sir yeah thanks for having me i had a good time as well Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Chasing Poker Greatness. If you have yet to subscribe to the show, please take a second to do so on Apple Podcasts or wherever your favorite place to listen to podcasts may be. For more content from me, Coach Brad, please visit our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash enhance your edge, and I'll see you next time.